Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Simon Tifoli Show, episode 15. Today I have an amazing guest. So, you have a blog, or oh, you're looking for PR. How do you get that PR? And if you have a blog, how do you monetize that blog? Today, I have an amazing guest. Lewis, mostly Lewis. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell me about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Oh, man. Uh, okay. You want to start with the boring stuff, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Grew up, I grew up in, uh, in Delaware, which okay. is a small state outside of uh, just south of Philadelphia. Okay. Um, known mostly for uh, corporate headquarters and meth labs, but I grew up yeah. in more the, the north side, which is sort of the corporate headquarters side. Yeah. Um, but I don't come from a corporate or entrepreneurial family at all. My parents were um, still are uh, yeah. uh, literature professors at the University of Delaware. Oh wow! Um, and I uh, um, I went to undergrad at the University of Delaware, studied uh, English literature, and then decided I didn't really want to do that. So okay. I studied psychology. Okay. Decided I liked that. Mm -hmm. Then I went and did a uh, master's degree in France, where I met one of my co-founders, mm -hmm. and then he and I and a guy I met in. Uh, in undergrad at Delaware, I uh, yeah. started PressCast, and, yeah. oh, and I did a PhD in neuroscience in the meantime, and, and that's the condensed version. I, I like how you slid that in there, PhD <laughs> yeah, in neuroscience. Yeah, I forgot, that's, actually. You know, that's, but, yeah. yeah, oh, that's incredible. So tell us about PressCast. What is PressCast? What does it do? Okay. How did you come up with the idea for it? Okay, so what is it and what does it do? Yeah. Um, so PressCast is a collaborative marketplace mm -hmm. for content marketing. Okay. Um, so basically, if you have been anywhere near content marketing in yeah. you know the last 10 years, which if you're a marketer, you have. Um, what you know is that it's extremely tedious and extremely yeah. painful, but in the long run, actually pretty effective, right? Mm -hmm. So the way I like to, to describe it is it's sort of, um, uh, it's sort of like the tortoise and the hare. Mm -hmm. um, the you know, press, or sorry, uh, content marketing is very much the tortoise's strategy. Mm -hmm. It's slow and steady. You have to put out content consistently. You have a long production cycle, but in the end it pays off. Mm. Presscast is a jetpack for the tortoise. Okay. So it lets you make that, it makes, lets you use that same strategy, but yeah. just accelerate the result. Amazing. The way it works is, what we say is stop thinking about creating engaging content mm. and start capturing an engaging content. Okay. So flip it on its head and instead of trying to guess what your audience likes and is yeah. interested in and making that stuff, what you want to do is go and look at what they're already reading mm -hmm. and then insert your message in there. into right. those places. Okay. So very concretely, mm -hmm. Presscast will connect you with uh, press articles that are relevant to your customers mm -hmm. and it will let you embed little bits of text that you write natively into the article. Amazing. So, Lewis, what inspired you to start this idea? How did you come up with this? Um, it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, I'll start by by saying how I decided to start a company. Okay. Because at first we didn't. Okay. I, at first, I knew I wanted to, to to start a company. I just didn't know what it would do. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's actually the case for a lot of people. And mm. and, and I actually think that's okay. Yeah. Um, and then in a, at a sort of later date. Um, then I figured out what I would do, and 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 it was Presscast. So yeah. initially, I was in research, and um, so I was I was doing uh, cognitive neuroscience, and reasonably enjoying it. I really liked sort of the technical aspects of it. And then actually, mm -hmm. I, I, one of my friends at the time uh, mm -hmm. in my master's program, Guillaume, mm -hmm. who is now one of my co-founders. Mm -hmm. um, he and I just sort of got into little side projects where we would just sort of take some of the stuff that we've like learned. Um, you know, in classes, like, so we had a, we had a psycholinguistics class where we learned about different like measures of word similarity, mm -hmm. um, including this really simple one that's called Levenstein distance. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, if you take two words, it's like how many characters you have to change in order to make one word, the other word. Okay. And it gives you like a, a an impression of like how similar the two words are. Amazing. So we got to thinking really, yeah, this is kind of fun. It's like, yeah. I don't really know what we're going to do with it yet, but, oh, but, but we kind of like it. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we realized like, oh man, actually, um, we can use this to like post affiliate links programmatically mm -hmm. in, um, in like forums. And mm -hmm. so we can start looking for, um, you know, words that are similar to like, uh, you know, like dating words and we can mm -hmm. put links for like, uh, eHarmony and that kind of thing and make mm -hmm. a little bit of affiliate money. And we, we, we did that we made a little bit of affiliate money mm -hmm. and it wasn't about the money. It was about yeah. sort of the fun of like getting our hands in and, and, so, and yeah. taking these techniques we knew and like mm -hmm. just doing something, anything with them. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I made the comment to Guillaume, I was like, you know, if I could spend the rest of my life doing this, mm -hmm. that's what I'd do. I would live in a box on the street mm -hmm. just to continue doing this with my life. Amazing. Yeah. And his response was like, well, what do you think 
being an entrepreneur is, it's <laughs> is just hopefully it comes with a house, yeah, not a yeah, box. Not a box, yeah. And, and so that's when I was like, oh yeah, you know, mm-hmm. what, what attracted me to research initially was mm-hmm. you're your own boss, yeah, um, within reason, mm-hmm. um, and you can just get into things you're interested yeah, in. Yeah. And and what occurred to me, or what 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 you sort of showed me here was, well, yeah, entrepreneurship gives you that too. Yeah. And then from there, it was like, well, if I'm going to be begging people for money, I would rather beg uh, like VCs for money than grant mm. committees for money. Mm. Um, so that decision was made. So mm. so so we assembled a team, um, and and that's when I reached out to Casey, who uh, was a longtime friend from from UD University of Delaware. Mm. Got him on board as our CTO, and then we were like, okay, now what? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think when you when you have a set of skills and you're yeah. like, now what? You inevitably become a consultancy. Yeah. So that was fine for a while. We did mm. some consultancy stuff, mm-hmm. and at one point we started bringing on uh, another one of my friends. Um, Longtime friend, um, we met when we were like fifteen. Um, wow. We 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 served in the French Army together. Still do actually as reservists. Okay. Um, and just real sharp guy. And I was like, you know, come to our meetings because you're clever, you're corporate, so you can teach us some stuff that we don't know, mm-hmm. and we'll have a good time and talk about interesting things. And so mm-hmm. he came, and he was in PR at the time, mm-hmm. and. Uh, he would just tell us about his day job and like tell us about PR. Mm. And um, we were like, how is this allowed to exist? Mm -hmm. Like I will go on the record as saying the PR industry is a complete scam. Save for maybe (laughs) 0.0001%. Like, Mm. Um, ninety percent. I'm probably this is probably like you know commercial suicide, but yeah, you know, screw no. it. I'll say it. I, somebody's got to take a stand. Exclusive for someone to put a show. <laughs> someone's got to take a stand here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. I'm slightly exaggerating, but but yeah. I'll still I'll still paint a bleak picture because that's probably what the audience wants. Mm. Um, if you're a PR agent, here's how it works. It's you pick up the phone, you call a bunch of people and tell them you're a PR agent. Congratulations, that's the only qualification you need. Really. Um, yeah, okay. just give me your phone. I can be a PR agent now if you okay. want. You know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And and then so you sign a couple people on, and generally yeah. what they're going to ask you for is press coverage of some sort. Yeah. Um, so to be fair to them, uh, good PR agents will tell you, well, there's not just press coverage. You know, go do a TED talk, start your own podcast. So they'll mm-hmm. they'll you know they can teach you useful things, but eighty percent of them will just be like, oh yeah yeah sure, I know plenty of guys. I know a guy who works here. I know a guy who works there. You're like yes, awesome. How much? Like mm-hmm. well. Uh, it's going to cost you like, you know, maybe between one and 3000 a month. Mm. And there's no obligations of results. I am just yeah. going to report on my time spent. I bill hourly. And if it works, good for you. If it doesn't, it's because you screwed up. Mm. So here's what happens. They've got one client that accounts for about 80% of their uh, income. Mm. So they spend like 99% of their time working on that client. That's everybody cool. else, that, that long tail, everybody else gets one day of their, of their week, of their month. And they'll pick up the phone, they'll just go down the list, make some calls and be like, okay, if one or two of these, you know, something bites, good, they'll sign on for another three months. Okay. The rest of them, wow. here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do two things. I'm firstly going to do a lot of fancy reporting with a lot of graphs to show that I did a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Then I'm going to tell you, the client, I'm going to say, okay, well, the problem is uh, you're not interesting. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if you pay me $5,000, i will i will do you a media training session that'll teach you to be interesting in front of the camera and we can try again. Mm. Okay. If that doesn't work, mm. then they'll go, okay, yep, yeah, sorry, I couldn't make it work. However, I can recommend some very competent colleagues. Okay. So then they will refer you to colleagues. Guess what their colleagues are doing? Yeah. Paying them the same, same thing. Same and thing. just around <laughs> and around and around wow, it goes. Wow. So, crazy, yeah. you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, mm. but we were sort of like shocked by this and at some point somebody made the joke that was like wait a minute so what you're saying is if i started like 300 wordpress blogs Mm -hmm. and just put trash content on them um you could send all your disappointed clients to me i could get them quoted left and right and then that would actually be a win and they would sign on again he was like yeah Mm -hmm. so initially we were like oh maybe we should do something like that then we realized well a it's not a very like good business model for a number of reasons um and b um, part of the problem too is that actually, yeah, people sometimes aren't very interesting and it's not that they're doing interesting, it's not that they're not doing interesting things, it's that mm. they don't know how to write about it. Yeah. So then our insight was, okay, so you have a situation where you have people doing interesting things, yeah. needing coverage. Yeah. You have people who are really good at writing, uh, you know, what you would call like publishers, bloggers, mm-hmm. podcasters, yeah. um, but Thank struggling you. to get paid, <laughs> yeah. like really struggling to get paid, mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, mm-hmm. like a CPM on like an ad of like, five pounds is like payday yeah and it's like you can't make a living with that yeah um 
So basically you have an offer, you have a demand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get those guys who know how to make content to continue making great content. And let's just match them with the people who don't know how to make content, but have interesting stuff. Yeah. And Presscast was born. From there, it was yeah, just yeah, yeah. pivots and iterations. Amazing. Wow. That's incredible. So at what stage are you at today right now? Um, we are pre-seed funded. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we are pre-seed funded by yeah. EF. Um, entrepreneur first. Yeah, entrepreneur first, right? Yeah. Um, and our demo day, so the demo day for EF is on March 27th, and that officially okay. kicks off our seed round. So uh, we have about, uh, yeah, five five weeks to get uh, to get our pitch uh, ready. ready. Yeah. And then we're going to raise some undisclosed amount Imagine. of money. Yeah. Um, my personal hope is north of a million, but, wow. yeah. you know, in saying that, it's going to depend on what well, a do we really need that much, or is this, you know, and yeah, and yeah. b like what are the terms and that kind of thing. Mm. But the reason we're we're looking for a, a reasonably sizable um, uh, seed round as far as these things go is because we actually have several like big feature and big product development plays that we want to that we want to get out there. So Amazing. it's 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 been a wild ride. Yeah. <laughs> so how big is the community of uh, publishers you have on your? platform right now so we launched about two months ago yeah. just shy of two months ago mm -hmm. and we have a little bit less than 2,000 advertisers wow. on the site who are wow. active yeah. and uh, a little bit over 500 uh, publishers wow. across mm -hmm. 30 or so uh, give or take five mm -hmm. um, industry verticals so things like you know fintech or like marketing or mm -hmm. SEO or uh, you know food tech, yeah. fast moving consumer goods, that kind of stuff. Amazing, that's incredible, wow. So I know that obviously you have a very international team mm -hmm. that are kind of spread around. How do you guys collaborate? How do you guys, you know, like maximize the time you work together? Yeah, um, this has been one of those things that's both a problem and an opportunity. Okay. Um, it, it's weird, right? So uh, I'm in London. Yeah. Um, Guillaume, our CPO, is in Montreal. So that's yeah. six hours behind us. And then uh, Casey, our CEO, is three hours behind Guillaume in Seattle. Yeah. So then there's this obvious problem, which is that there's only so much time in the day when we're all yeah, exactly. active. Exactly. Yeah. And so this this is bad. Yeah. But what's good actually is that there's an opportunity to have nearly continuous operations around the clock. Like, and since yeah, we're yeah. all kind of like yeah. we all have our specialties, but we can all like basically do kind of everything. Mm. Um, we've really leaned into that and tried mm. to like basically make that into a process. Mm. Um, so this is sort of where my, my, my bit of experience um, as an NCO in the French army kicks in. It's like, how do you manage small teams? And it turns out there are a couple of really, really simple principles that come into mm. play here. Mm. The biggest one is have only one correct official way of doing things. Okay. Right, because what that means is everybody knows what the output of the work should look like, and nobody, everybody knows where to look for the input into the next stage. So okay. um, that's the first one. It's just there's one way of doing things, and if it doesn't work, you know, by all means, talk about it and change that one way. But make sure that there's not like, you know, if there's three different ways of submitting an article, like mm -hmm. a Google Ads link in, or sorry, a Google a Doc link in Slack, mm -hmm. or uh, you know. Uh, emailing a, a, a doc file as an attachment, right? You start to run into problems where it's like, hey, I never got the thing, so I couldn't start work today. Mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, I sent it to you just in this other thing, and then you lost three hours, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the first one. Um, the second one is everything in writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Jeff Bezos uh, has like popularized this notion, I think, with like the six-page memo or something like that. Oh, no, I haven't had that. Oh, uh, okay, so I, I like this. I, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily... Maybe we'll grow into the six-page memo, but we're, yeah. but the, but we're not long. quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, right. But there's there's a value in that, and the mm. idea is this is again a tortoise and a hare thing, right? Mm. Um, the idea behind the six-page memo is you shouldn't just describe the work to be done. You should mm. describe the context in which the work is being done. Okay. The reason we got into this context, what we're trying to get out of it, and how at each stage the work is both going to advance your cause, and you have to sort of prove that it like relates to the real external reality. The ah. way you do this is you tell a story, okay. right? Um, and that takes about six pages. And mm. it's like, you know, you have to ask yourself, am I, it's more time being wasted creating a coherent six page memo that clearly outlines an actionable strategy, mm. or is more time being wasted with a lot of 30 second memos that 
lead to work that doesn't matter and that are incomprehensible to the people who read them. You, it's yeah. a trade-off and, and mm. the six pages probably doesn't matter per se, but mm. there's probably some correct balance in your organization. Mm. So uh, we are huge fans of everything in writing mm -hmm. and being, I think, I think, I think our guideline, our answer to this is, can you articulate why you think this will work and why you think it's the right decision? Okay. A gut feeling isn't enough. You have to be able yeah. to say why that gut feeling came to be. And, and that really, really, really helps with the distributed team where mm. we're not in the same area. So we're not feeling the same things. We're not under the same pressures. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's just a question of like syncing up. Mm. And then the last thing, this is a really easy one, really low hanging fruit. And this is like right out of the military handbook. Mm. It's have two channels of communication. Okay. You have one channel for everyday ordinary communications, mm -hmm. and then you have what's called the exception channel. Okay. It's if shit hits the fan, mm. that's the one you that's that's the emergency one to bypass all the day to day clutter and just mm. get the message out. So for us, it's Slack because mm -hmm. it leaves you know you can search the history and yeah. then you know the other guy doesn't have to be awake and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So just by default, anything I do, mm. I tell people I'm doing it in Slack. I share my stuff. Just running log this is what i'm doing this is what i'm working on now people yeah. don't read 80 percent of what i write when yeah. i write it yeah. but it's it's on the record yeah. and you can yeah. look it up mm -hmm. and then every once in a while something urgent happens mm -hmm. and the phone lines are clear it's not like you know casey and guillaume aren't like chatting about their days and i'm yeah. sitting here trying to call it's it's that's the emergency line mm -hmm. um so it sounds a bit dramatic like that but yeah. actually it's a really really good way to work even even in a non-distributed team i think yeah, I really like the fact that you have that one clear channel of communication because the thing is, especially with social media now, like I get so many notifications to the point where I just have to switch all my notifications up from all yeah. the platforms I use because there's so much clutter around yeah. and information gets lost there. So I always want to kind of just have that one line. Yeah. That's a really good idea. It's less is more, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like how less is more, more, but then there's another saying, which is two is one and one is none. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> oh yeah, so it's, it's, a, yeah. it's another army one. Yeah. Um, it's... Yeah, you know, less is more, you know, yeah. but you don't want to do less is more to the point of only having one of the thing, because yeah. if that breaks or if something exceptional happens, yeah, then, then yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. what? What else have you learned from the army? Because obviously you have a lot of lessons you've taken from the army that you're applying to your startup and your company. What else in general? So this is very, very meta, Yeah. but I've learned a way of learning in these kind of very self-contained pithy lessons right the, okay. the way in which i'm actually telling you what i learned in the army is something mm. i learned in the army okay. <laughs> it's, and, it's, and, yeah. and it, it's, it's you know the thing you have to understand with the army is that there's yeah. there's a lot of different types of people mm. from a lot of different like uh social economic backgrounds a lot of different levels of education you have some people who are functionally illiterate mm. um and other people who have like you know uh advanced degrees and they're all working together and you know, sometimes yeah. it can be hard to, to communicate. And mm -hmm. the thing is, everybody has something to contribute, so you have to just find a way to, to, to make this work. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways you make this work is by, again, sort of storytelling, and in this case, very, very self-contained. So these sort of small, pithy lessons, um, they're almost proverbs, two is one, one is none. Yeah. Um, you know, always have two lines of communication. There should always be one, and it, there should only be exactly one correct way of doing something. Yeah. You know, things like that. Um, or um, order plus counter order equals disorder. Okay. And that's, that's, a, that's a good management principle. Something else I learned is if okay. you tell people, think twice before actually giving a task. Okay. So, and again, this is the other thing with, with the other reality with anything, not just military, is that there's, mm. there's trade-offs, right? So, mm. you know, yeah, sometimes you have to give counter orders and tell people to do something differently than what they were doing five minutes ago. Mm. But be careful because, you know, in this day and age where, where people are trying to increase agility and, you know, it's like every, every five seconds, like you said, you're getting pinged in your email, like, do this, no, actually do that, no, actually do that. Well, mm. you have to be careful because what happens? Yeah. You have a group of five people. First people get, everybody gets the first notification, then half the people get the update, yes. and then you have half the team working on the wrong thing, and then the other team working on the right thing, and then they're yeah. fighting over what the right thing is, so order plus counter order disorder, mm -hmm. right? Just things like that. Yeah. And then I think the last one I learned that I like a lot, mm -hmm. this is a more abstract one, but but this is one we, we talk about. It. There's not a single day mm -hmm. it doesn't come up mm -hmm. in, uh, in our conversation, is this notion of actions per minute. Okay. Um, so the idea is, 
let's say you are planning to do something, anything. It can be, you know, storming a building or it can be like, you know, uh, you know executing a marketing strategy. It doesn't matter. Mm. Um, you'll have a plan, right? Hopefully a good plan. Yeah. And the minute you start actually executing that plan, mm -hmm. another army saying comes in, which is the enemy is maneuvering. Okay. So whatever you started doing, yeah. the enemy is going to start counter Country, maneuvering yeah. or, or, you know, if there's not a clear enemy, just the world is going to continue to do its thing. And, and the reality that you planned for within about five minutes will no longer Change. be exactly the same reality. Yeah. Therefore, the winner is not the person who has the perfect plan. Mm -hmm. It's the person who has a reasonably good plan. Mm -hmm. Again, I think Jeff Bezos says like, you know, 70% correct today is better than 100% correct tomorrow. Right. Okay. It's the same thing. So somebody who has a reasonably good plan, mm -hmm. but then is able to update his plan yeah. the fastest or her plan. Um, so really the, the metric, to the extent that you should really care about any metric, mm. the metric you should care about is how many actions per minute are you capable of taking? Because that's the number of course corrections that you're going to be able to affect. Okay. So this is how we... <laughs> so this yeah. is this is how we this is how we look at it and mm -hmm. and then that has to be weighed against things like you know counter orders and that kind of thing yeah um that's interesting <laughs> yeah Do you know what? you just reminded me when you talk about the field corrections you remind, you reminded me of a really famous quote that is normally quoted in the startup world which is that um you you always have a plan until that's mike tyson <laughs> that's mike tyson yeah, yeah, but mike tyson actually got this quote oh, really? from a military general yeah wow. So Mike Tyson always say, well, he used to say that I always had a plan until I got punched in the face. But he actually got that from a okay. military general that used to say that I always had a plan until I hit the battlefield. Like, you know, you always have a plan until you hit the battlefield. All right. Because things right. change. Yeah. And you have to be able to react in that, you know. Yeah. And, and I notice in the startup world, the entrepreneurial world, there's so many entrepreneurs from the military background with the military background that are doing really, really well. And there's a lot to learn and all of these principles definitely definitely apply yeah, in the yeah. business world um, because they help kind of shape the direction and the way you operate things yeah i think you have to be careful not to not to put the military on a pedestal either i mean of course yeah um, it, it has its problems it's like any other uh institution mm. it also varies a lot by country there's of a course. reason there's a reason i served in france and yeah, not yeah. the u.s okay it's, it's not the same it's not the same military okay. um, with, with with all due respect to my yeah. my uh, you know american military counterparts it's just mm. that um, there's a, fetish, a fetishization of mm. the military in the U.S. that I am cautious about, even though individually most people who serve that I've met have been have been absolutely great people. Right. Um, there's a last thing I, I want to mention, if you don't mind, yeah, that, sure. that I like a lot. Yeah. You know, you know how the, like um, you've heard about the, like flat hierarchies and like bossless organizations yes, and stuff like that. Yes. Um, so there's this idea that like in in the last maybe five years, ten years, maybe that there's this idea that like hierarchical sort of tree structures of management are rigid mm -hmm. and they're bad and mm -hmm. these are like 80s corporate bosses who used to like stomp on the little yeah. guy and therefore <laughs> the solution is the extreme opposite right yeah. it's like yeah. uh, it's just just go completely 180 on this and yeah. say no bosses mm -hmm. all right one thing i i so one of the uh, one of the um uh one of the officers uh, i was talking mm -hmm. to one of the officers at at, at, uh, at the reserves at the yeah. uh the 94th infantry regiment in yeah. uh, in france yeah. and he was saying yeah oh, you know this is, this is fascinating to me because it's like they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater." Mm -hmm. and he goes one of the things that that we've noticed time and time again mm -hmm. in um you know like any sort of like um insurgency groups or terrorist cells or what have you mm -hmm. that, that have these sort of flat unstructured hierarchies is actually no 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 there's no such thing as a bossless or a non-hierarchical organization mm. that doesn't exist yeah what does exist is an organization with an implicit hierarchy okay so there is a boss mm -hmm. it's just people don't necessarily agree on who he is <laughs> and <laughs> right yeah. and there's and there's no obvious um there's no obvious pecking order and this yeah. leads to internal strife and and, and whatnot so yeah. the trick i think is yeah you don't want the super rigid structure mm. But you have to find a balance between having an, an excessively rigid structure mm -hmm. and and nothing. And hierarchies do have their advantages. Decisions yeah. can be made really quickly. blazingly quickly. When the army wants to do something, mm. wants to get something done, yeah. you can have tanks, airplanes, and troops in like ten minutes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and, and, and and there's I mean there's a mathematical property to this mm. too. It's like if you imagine a hierarchy, it's mm. like you know at the bottom let's say you have. Um, uh, you know, 1,024 
people. Mm -hmm. And I, I picked this number on purpose. Mm -hmm. And let's imagine that every two people has a boss. Okay. That means that basically the the longest possible path to get mm -hmm. from the the top. the top yeah. general to the guy in the ranks is going mm -hmm. to be log two mm -hmm. of the number of people. So it's mm -hmm. going to be like two, four, uh, eight, 16, uh, 32, uh, 64, 128, 512, mm -hmm. 1024. Mm -hmm. So basically there will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps to get to anyone mm -hmm. in this organization. And that's yeah. actually with a really bad structure. That means every two people has a boss. Yeah. If every five people have a boss, yeah. it's going to be like three steps, okay. four steps. Okay. So you can make blazingly fast decisions. You just don't want that hierarchy to get too deep. I see. Interesting. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> so obviously <laughs> you've learned a lot of things from the army and the startups, but I want to know more about what you've learned in the startup world, right? Sure. So you come from this world of academia and then, you know, research and, you know, consulting, and then you go into the entrepreneurship world. So what do you know now? Or what are the, some of the things you know now that you wish you'd known starting out? I, I'm sure, you know, it's a continuous learning process. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you don't learn in academia and that you don't learn in the army is that the rules that have been set mm -hmm. are not the real rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and by the way, I, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't credit um, my, my CPO and co-founder and friend, Guillaume, yeah. who like has this deep in his bones and who managed to like open my eyes to this reality, which mm -hmm. is that um, there are the explicit rules mm -hmm. and then there are the implicit rules. Yeah, yeah. And um, don't confuse the two mm -hmm. and understand when each one matters, mm -hmm. right? So there are certain times where playing by the official rule book will let you project legitimacy and that's good. Yeah. And there are other times where it means you're going to get burned by everybody who understands what the real rules are. And so... Yeah, I can't be any more specific. I probably could, but it would I would I would take you know ten minutes. Um, yeah. But it, it, this is a gut level understanding of the world, right? This yeah. isn't a head level understanding. Um, and yeah. you want to be careful with that. You don't want to be the guy who breaks all the rules and is like, yeah. oh, I'm you know the Nietzsche and Ubermensch. I do what I want. You know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no. that's the best way to fail. Mm. The other best way to fail is to think that the rules you were told were the real rules. Ah, uh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, because like you find yourself, like, you know, when I when I go to the startup world, I, I realize like there are a lot of things I didn't learn when I was at uni. When I went to business school and law school, I wasn't taught how to sell, for example. You know, yeah, yeah. how the hell do you learn how to sell? Um, yeah, was, and you're really really good at this. How how have you learned this? I mean, this is what. Uh, I, I, well, thank you. I didn't know I was really really good. No, at you're this. really good. Like, um, you, you, I I always run all the things I'm trying to do by you. Know? Um, I I don't I don't know. Yeah. I, I think it's uh yeah I don't know. I think it's just um. Actions per minute, mm. really? I okay. Mean, just, just, just try <laughs> and then, and then get, get that early feedback. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, you know, if I try this and I feel like I'm losing, yeah. well, then I better try something else, something else. Uh, yeah, or yeah. talk to someone or, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's a process and then you just sort of learn it. So being an entrepreneur is really, really hard, right? Like it's incredible. It's almost like an open secret. You know, people are really stressed and everyone is always trying to keep a straight face. And that, that, you know, that, yeah, that's yeah, fine yeah, for some yeah. people, but... How do you let loose? Like, how do you manage your mental health? How do you manage your the stress levels? How do you wind back? You know, in terms of your kind of managing your mental health and your you know stress levels. Yeah, I, I mean, all right. I'm going to take a bit of a contrarian view on on this as well. I think. Okay. Um, I don't think entrepreneurship is particularly hard. Mm -hmm. I think it's just that a lot of people have. I think a lot of people are particularly bad at managing themselves and having a healthy like life hygiene cool, yeah. and um and, and i can explain mm -hmm. um when i was in academia like mm -hmm. uh i i'm not a depressive person by nature yeah. i'm one of the most upbeat like yeah. reasonably optimistic of course, of course. people no, but i mean yeah. like i mean you know and, and i don't mean that i'm like better than anyone it's just there are certain people who who have this struggle where they are mm -hmm. depressive by nature i am not i am quite the opposite i'm manic by nature if anything um and yet mm -hmm. when i was in my phd i i think i went through something that could qualify as as a depression as like probably technically anxiety fueled depression i was never clinically diagnosed i never went and got help mm -hmm. uh, i probably should have mm -hmm. um but but i had bad times really really bad times mm -hmm. Okay, looking back on that now, mm -hmm. um, 
and again, I want you know read between the lines. I think in a sense it was my fault. In a sense, mm-hmm. so yes, there's a context. Yes, um, the context. You know, you don't have direct control over the concept on the over the context. But mm-hmm. you know, let's be real for a second. Yeah. I was not getting up and going to sleep at the same day. Yeah. I was not watching what I was eating. Um, I was blowing off steam at the end of the week by partying. Yeah. Um, and well, not, not, you know, not, not horribly. I'm not a party animal, but still, yeah. um, I lived by myself in an apartment. Um, mm. And, you know, I was working on my starter, which means my head was in like code all the time. And then I would yeah. go to like work and my head would be in code. Yeah. And then my girlfriend was far away and I would see her every, every like two or three weeks. Mm. And it's just like in the long run, that's that's bad hygiene. Like mm. in, in the long run, that's going to mess with you. And it's very, very insidious because you don't necessarily realize that the way you feel stems from the way you're acting because it's that's a lot true. of little things that get together. That, that, yeah. Um, and then, you know, I graduated, I moved to London, moved in with, with, with my girlfriend. Um, mm-hmm. And it's like things changed. Things mm-hmm. changed because I started having a daily social contact okay. with someone. Yeah. Um, I started cooking for two, which meant that like, you know, I was cooking and, and yeah. not like buying McDonald's. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we were getting up together and going to sleep roughly together, mm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that during the exceptionally hard periods, um, because there are these like, you know, of these course. sprint moments and these like notes, the grindstone moments. Yeah. It means that in those moments I was working from a solid base. Yeah. So I think when talking about um, um, like mental health in the workplace, I, I, I completely agree that there are very perverse incentives and very bad work structures and very bad structural issues that can push people to the brink. But mm-hmm. I think it's also important to recognize that there are there is some number of us for whom it's less a structural problem than a personal problem. Yeah. Now, again, I, I would never on a case by case basis be like, oh, you're that one. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. get your shit together, Simon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not my place. And, yeah. and and I think in almost all cases, it's a mix of both. But. Mm. For me personally, just like I don't do anything on weekends, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I yeah, don't I know. do anything on weekends. I mm. spend time with with the missus. I mm. see some friends occasionally. Yeah. Once a month, I'll go to like a a dinner at a friend's and like have a couple of drinks. But like mm. you know, and then yeah, like I'm turning into like Jesus. I'm turning into my old man. Nah, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, but yeah, yeah. No. But I'm realizing they're right. I'm realizing yeah, all this yeah. stuff my parents told me were was yeah, mostly yeah. right, and, and I'm yeah, happier yeah, yeah. for it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you know, especially in a staff community, you have people who are like, oh, you know, hustle, hustle hard, no sleep, yeah. no sleep. Yeah, no, no. Why would you do that's that? Like, exactly. I like, got another army thing for you. Yeah. Never run when you can walk, never walk when you can stand, when you can stand, never stand when you can sit, never sit when you can sleep, and never, ever, ever, ever pass up on a warm meal and a cold shower. Wow. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's like, take care of yourself, man. Yeah. Take care of yourself. And, you know, actually, you know what? Mm-hmm. Uh, a very smart man once told me something very, very smart mm-hmm. uh at um uh what was that place called where we met because it's you i'm talking oh. about here <laughs> um, <laughs> i think about baker street yeah, uh, yeah the yeah, couple yeah. project the couple project which closed, closed down now, in the yeah. meantime yeah yeah <laughs> but uh the first time we met you told me something which like stuck with me which was you know who's the person you talk to you to the most oh okay yeah yeah, <laughs> hey, easier, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. you talk to yourself more than anybody else that's true yeah and yeah. Analyze how you're talking to yourself. Yeah. Do you know that in the, in the depths of, of my, my, my bad time during, yeah. uh, during my PhD, mm-hmm. every morning mm-hmm. I would wake up, I would crawl out of bed, I would get in the shower, and, mm-hmm. and I would mumble to myself, get up, you lazy piece of shit. Okay. Right? And it's like, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, p- people in the uh, personal development world, you know, talk about uh, affirmations and this sort of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because literally by saying stuff to yourself, you know, you can get yourself out of a state. You can get yourself yeah, moving or put or, yourself into or down or <laughs> whatever. So uh, if wow. nothing else, it's a good indicator of how you're doing. And if yeah, you find course. yourself saying these things a lot, it's like, yeah, mm, that's exactly. a red flag. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, that's, that's really, that's a very interesting insight, man. And yeah, it's been well, a couple of projects is closed now. So <laughs> they moved somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently they, they just moved. But yeah, they moved. Yeah, indeed. I, I, I occasionally bump into people that work there, but, you know, they, they've moved. So. One thing I wanted to ask you about is in terms of, obviously, the journey is always has highs and lows. I mean, if you care to share, what's been your highest high, lowest low? I mean, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, sure, sure, sure. Anything um, that comes to mind, you know. Because obviously, making that transition, I can imagine, first of all, you know, moving from the States to France, then from France to London, and then. Those the were oddly the highs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those, those were the highs. Oh, you love traveling oh, and relocation? Well, okay. Actually, I don't. Did uh, you like build groups of friends and everything you leave? And yeah, then you yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know? This is true, but it's yeah. like I've never had to move. 
I've never had to move. It's always been a voluntary thing. Okay. Um, when I moved to France, mm-hmm. it was because it was like end of the line. I grew up in a university town, mm-hmm. went to that university, and I traveled. Thank yeah, yeah. God. But at the end of that, it was like end of the line. What else? Mm-hmm. This whole this whole town ticks around UD. So at the end of UD, it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. So I was like, well, I'm half French on paper. Mm. I speak the language. I have family over there. And, mm. uh, you know, I need to go connect with my roots. So I'm yeah. going to go do that. Yeah. So that was an adventure, right? Okay. It was like yeah. an adventure. Uh, you know, then I met a girl. Then mm-hmm. she started her PhD in uh, mm. London. Yeah. And we were at a distance for a while. And then mm. I finished my PhD. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, now I want to start my company and I want to do this stuff. Yeah. And London is the, London place, is the place to be. And, <laughs> yeah. I've, you know, and, and the woman I love is there. So mm. so adventure, right? Yeah. So that's always been actually a high. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. And then I think the other high was like just getting that pre-seed money was was just like all yeah. of a sudden it's like, wow, we're, we're, we're You're real, real right? <laughs> You're validated, right? Yeah. I have accountants now, dude. Oh, like, wow. I feel, like a, I feel like an adult. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's incredible. That's like, amazing. Yeah. The little things, you know. <laughs> no, but that's not little. That's incredible because, yeah. you know, we know the stats, right? Going from zero what is incredibly hard. Most startups fail in like, what, the first 18 months or the fact that you're doing something. Uh, what I really love as well is that you're empowering people in the publishing world and you're redefining an industry. Because, you know, people that write, like I know plenty of bloggers, you know, they have their own little publications. Mm-hmm. And it's that industry has been struggling for a long time, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, because of social media, because of all these other platforms out there. But you're bringing it back. Yeah. And you're creating a way for someone that has had this passion that's constantly stuck at it and have an audience of, of monetizing. Because the majority of advertisers, I mean, we, we've worked with influencer marketers and um you know, they, they always obviously focus on social media platforms. But, you know, this method still works. It works really well for SEO, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what you're offering is an alternative there. So, so yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, so, yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I really hope, I guess my, my, my megalomaniac dream with all of this is mm. I really hope to see a flourishing industry of small publishers. And, like, you know, I think everybody's starting to get a little nervous about uh, you know, Facebook, et cetera, yeah. controlling the media. Yeah. Um, and really what I'm, what I'm realizing is publishers have a lot to offer the world, mm-hmm. both in terms of like entertainment and serious necessary information. Yeah. Um, I think those who are like real journalists mm. probably shouldn't be using Presscast, mm-hmm. at least for now, because, you know, editorial independence, and that kind of thing is really important. So I think yeah. that problem's not solved. And the reason I mention it it's because I don't want people to see press gas and be like, oh, that's solved. That's no, 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 no. There's yeah. something to be done there and that needs to be fixed. Fair enough. But everybody else, everybody mm. who is um, either writing commercially mm. or for entertainment or whatever, yeah. like that's a really, really valuable thing to have as a society. Mm. And I would, my, my dream is if, you know, I would love for like a 15 year old's blog mm. to help him pay for college. Wow. Right. Like yeah. that would be really cool. And at the same time, have some content agency uh, that runs a bunch of like really interesting blogs on a niche subject. Like you know, there's one, um, there's one that's like on our on our site that's about like succulent plants. Okay. Right, and it's yeah. like you know, well, yeah, I guess there are people who are really into really? succulent plants. Well, yeah. that guy should make a living too. He's yeah. he knows a lot about them, right? Yeah. Like you know, amazing. Um, okay. So yeah, that's, that's really cool. Man. That's what I hope will come to this. Yeah. Oh wow. It, that was going to lead into my next question is where do you see Prescast next three to five years? Obviously. So that's the that's the yeah. from the heart speech. Yeah. Um, the the economic speech now is um, so Prescast basically right now lets you monetize any sort of text content. Uh-huh. Um, so there are two things we want to do. We want to first like lean into that and make it even you know bigger and better. So yeah. let you you know let let advertisers embed videos or images or you know all sorts of cool stuff in the text. Yeah. Uh, while as we do now um, making sure that the you know, the, to protect the publisher and, you know, maintain his editorial control and make sure mm-hmm. that he doesn't find himself, like, having to publish anything he doesn't want to. Yeah, of course. Right, because that's, I mean, that's really important. Yeah. Um, and the second thing we want to do is we want to start repeating this, um, this, um, this approach mm-hmm. to other media as well, so mm-hmm. podcasts. Mm-hmm. So, okay, imagine an advertiser who wants to reach entrepreneurs because he has, like, I don't know, he, he has like some really interesting offer maybe on like cloud computing credits. Mm-hmm. Um, imagine that he can log on to Prescast mm-hmm. and just give you the, the, the commercial bit. Mm-hmm. And every time you say it, you get paid. 
Yeah. Okay, oh, it's all yeah. above board. You, We're you looking for that, sponsors. This is sponsored by. <laughs> by yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, okay. So you're looking for sponsors. How are you yeah. looking for sponsors right now? Just uh, cold calling. Yeah. Uh, there's stalking no real people way. LinkedIn. There's no real way. <laughs> and and, and, yeah. and my, my, my hope is that someday you can just get on Presscast mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, look, here are all the sponsors. Yeah. Today I'll do this one. Okay. Yeah. Tomorrow I'll do that one. I'll be, I'll be amazing. Right. right. And yeah. then video and then images and then yeah. just the whole the whole multimedia spectrum. That's that's Dang. that's what we're doing this seed round for, and that's where we want to go. Amazing, cool. So if someone has an idea, they have a dream, then you know they're in a shower, they've had a light bulb moment, and they've come up with this fantabulous idea that's going to make them a million dollars. What would you say to them? What key pieces of advice would you say to somebody that Take. has a dream to get? Your like time. one or two things take yeah. your time really take your time that's an interesting because in the start part everyone's like you know yeah. fail fast yeah, move yeah, 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 yeah. but you know what that is that's survivorship bias masquerading <laughs> as strategy okay right this is this is what the vcs tell you and this mm. is what the startups that have survived the vcs tell you, tell you. yes right? um, yeah so with vcs it's like yeah 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 just there are plenty of them just bring them in bring them in bring right. them in. yeah and no, no. If, if what are you trying to do? Are you trying to maximize that VC fund success? Mm. Jesus, EF is going to kill me. Mm. Are you trying? <laughs> are you trying to maximize your VC's portfolio success, mm. or are you trying to maximize your success? Yeah. And my my thing, therefore, is take your time. Now, there mm. is there is such thing as taking too much time, mm. but I mean, I, I think there's something to be said for if everybody's telling you to move left, at right, least strongly yeah, yeah. consider moving right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. True. Um, yeah. Um, so it's like. Because everybody is repeating go fast, go fast, go fast, mm. on average, people tend to go too fast, I think. Mm. Um, I know that like Guillaume in particular is a is a is a stop, think, analyze. Your co-founder. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then move kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Casey, our CTO, whom I actually haven't talked very much about, which mm. is a shame because he's he's an exceptional guy, yes. um, is the most conservative in the face of risk person I've ever met. And I, and I mean this in the best way possible. He is the, oh, okay. He is the most meticulous person I've ever met. The guy could be a surgeon. Um, wow. So this has become my barometer. If Casey says it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intelligent risk, mm-hmm. it's probably an intelligent <laughs> risk okay. because anything else and he'll be like, mm, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, so, and this is my second thing is surround yourself, mm-hmm. um, surround yourself. Surround yourself with people who can push back. Okay. Right. I, I have. Not a, yes, people, but people that can push back. Well, people who have who have like you know who want the same things as you in, on the whole, but yeah. who can also push back and, mm-hmm. and who are and, and who are complementary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I have a very um, sort of exuberant personality, mm-hmm. and when I get excited about something, I can I can really really lean into people like yeah, let's do let's do it now. Why are we yeah. waiting? Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? Get in the car. Let's go. Let's yeah, go. Let's yeah. go. Let's go. And then you have somebody like Yum who knows how to. You know, is one of the few people mm. who knows how to how to hit the brakes and be like no mm. at least not until you've convinced me that it's a good idea yeah, yeah. and then Casey is one of the few people who can like make me doubt what I think is a really safe thing mm. so you know it's like you know I, I don't know I, I'm struggling to find an analogy here but it's like um, yeah this is totally safe look yeah. you know I, I've, I've, uh, I've thought about it I've seen other people do it nothing wrong can happen and yeah. Casey will be the guy who goes Oh yeah, this can go wrong. This yeah. can go wrong, <laughs> and it's like yeah. so. So I think I think that's really important. Is find a really good team. team yeah. And by the way, this is what EF is 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 really good at doing. Yeah. Is is connecting people. Um, yeah. Who so talk about that. Uh, talk about your experience with EF. What is EF? And talk about what it does. And what has it done for you? Sure. So yeah. EF is um, a talent investor. Okay. And stands for Entrepreneur First. Yes, Entrepreneur First is yeah. a talent investment fund, mm-hmm. which is a kind of VC fund mm-hmm. that invests in people instead of projects. So this actually has some far-reaching implications, right? What that means is um, most VC funds, you go to them with a project, with a prototype, business plan, and it's like either they believe it or they don't. Yeah. EF, you come as a person with a set of skills and a set of interests. And they will have you meet people with complementary skills and interests. Mm-hmm. And then they will help you come up with an idea. And then they will give you a little bit of money to prototype that idea. This is the pre-seed phase. Amazing. And then they will um, get you on stage at Demo Day and have you pitch a seed round. And from there, it's the classical VC thing. So I think this is really smart. So I, mm-hmm. I actually didn't meet my co-founders through this. And we are sort of that weird group that you know has three co-founders instead of two and oh and they all met outside of EF oh and there's a pre-existing project uh, oh and their distributed team everything that EF 
yeah. officially doesn't really like, mm. um, but they, they kindly, graciously made an exception for us, and we've been really happy there. Um, but so looking around, what I've seen is that you have a lot of really talented people um, who, like everybody else, have strengths and weaknesses, and what they've been able to do is connect with people who complement those strengths and weaknesses. The one thing I would say um, with regards to EF is be a little bit careful about the pace. And and, and this is a really hard balance to to, to meet, right? To, to, yeah, it's a hard it's a hard balance to to achieve because there is a lot to be said for going fast, mm -hmm. right? EF is correct in pushing people to do more faster because you know analysis paralysis is a thing. Yeah. Um, people spend too much time speculating, not enough time testing. But this is all true, and they're very good at breaking that inertia. The flip side of that is that every once in a while, yeah. the smart thing to do is to stop, maybe even take the day. Absolutely, yeah. Right? There's no formula for this. It's just... Absolutely, yeah. The actions per minute. <laughs> yeah. I like how you keep coming back to actions per minute, man. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things I love about EF is that, you know, like we said, going from zero to one is incredibly difficult. That all of these accelerators and incubators that talk about, oh, you know, we support early stage entrepreneurs, but actually they don't really yeah, no, do they that. Don't. No, you have to have a product, a, a team, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. they really support companies in growth phase. But what they do, they really do what is on, you know, what they what it says on the tin, which is they consider yeah. the entrepreneur first. Well, look what, at the individual. what it says on the tin is yeah. enter as an individual, leave as a company. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. and you know, they put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. That goes. Of course, it's a highly selective, um, you know, uh, program and. Mm -hmm. um, it's still not easy to get into it, but I think there's a chance for somebody who has no, you know, like for example, I'm, you know, I'm a non-tech founder. If I've and I've been struggling to look for a tech co-founder for a while. I mean, I've been lucky to find mm -hmm. somebody now, but you know, if uh, that would have been a perfect, you know, opportunity for yeah, me yeah. to kind of get in there and sort of like, you know, try and because I think they have the best data on team dynamics and yes. confine because uh, they they merge people together. And so they have the best data on that. So it's the best place to be. And they have an incredible network as well. Incredible network. Yeah, because I believe what I understand is not everybody that gets onto the program eventually kind of goes on to do the whole entrepreneurial thing. Sometimes yes. people then end up working so with other... Yeah. Our cohort was something like 130 people. Wow. Then there's two months of team building. Mm -hmm. By the end of those two months, either you're in our team or you're out. Mm -hmm. um, then you have one month to prepare for investment committee. Uh, investment committee is where you do the initial pitch for the pre-seed investment. Mm -hmm. Then um, if you pass that, so, so this takes you down. So from about 130, team building, I think, cuts it maybe in half. Mm -hmm. And then those who pass, I see, I think there were like maybe 23, 24 teams. So wow. twice yeah. as many people. Yeah. And then, um, and that's just in London, right? They have, they have cohorts around the world. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, on demo day, you pitch, and I don't actually know what the stats are there, but I think I think if you pitch on demo day, provided you don't do something horrible like you know, mm. you know puke on stage or something, yeah. <laughs> I think they won't really let you pitch at demo day unless you have something to pitch, and if you have something to pitch, you'll usually raise something. So you're in a good place. You're in a good place. I mean, cool. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Okay. So um, a couple of things. I always ask. People or my guests in the show, like, do you have a piece of tech that you can't do with that, that you love using on a day to day basis that you always Does it have to be if digital? You, it doesn't. I mean, if your house is on fire, what is it? <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be digital. I'll get it right now. <laughs> Hang on. This I is mean, the best. Oh, really? Okay, let's get this going. <laughs> I ever spent in my life. Are you kidding me? Oh, this is great. This is a new exclusive. We haven't done this before. <laughs> I leave it to the. Yeah, yeah, the viewers to see. I leave, uh, it, I leave it to the viewer to decide oh, if, if, if Presscast has paid me to, to okay. pitch this. <laughs> um, they have not, this, but uh, yeah, yeah. you're familiar nice. with this thing. I feel so swag every what morning. What is it? What is it? Oh, what is it? <laughs> it's a laptop stand. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, wow. And yeah, adjustable height and all that. Yeah. I'm starting to get neck pain. Oh, yeah, because you're quite a tall dude. So yeah, yeah, so I was yeah, like yeah. hunched over like yeah, this. Yeah, of course, yeah. Code, little yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, this, this lifts it up. And then like, yeah, the laptop sits here. It's, yeah, And then yeah. it lifts it up and then you can get it to the right height. And then yeah, you yeah, just and then get can... a wireless keyboard and okay. a mouse. Okay, yeah. And it's like, oh, amazing. this is brilliant. What is it actually called? I don't know. <laughs> just, I, I think I, I think I went on, on Amazon and typed in like yeah. folding laptop stand. Okay. And Because I see people with standing desks, obviously. That's slightly different. Do you do that thing where you alternate between standing and... Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get sitting. up and walk away walk from the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some people, you know, stand and... 
But yeah, this is a very good tool to have for sure. Yeah. Cool. The other thing I want to ask you about is that what book have you read that has the has had the most impact on you? Could be recently or throughout your entire life. This is embarrassing. I don't read as much as I should. I read a lot of like scientific papers and that kind of stuff. And I it could, yeah, it that. could be. Um, because you did psychology, obviously, around psychology and data. There must, have, there must be something in there between. Are you a religious person? Has it been a religious book, for example? Um, or, you know, was I'm it a poem? Was it a, you know? Terribly, I'm not terribly religious. Um, give me a moment. I'll, I'll yeah, if we think, while we think of that, yeah, yeah. let's move on to the next thing. So on my Instagram, on my LinkedIn, I do this thing every Monday morning I call Simon T. Says, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one minute of motivation, inspiration, yeah, yeah, yeah. and encouragement to get, you know, to encourage other people. Um, yeah, so, I watch it every time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. so I always ask my guests, what is your one minute of motivation? What would you say to somebody to get them motivated, inspired and encouraged? What is that one minute? Of, what is your hype kind of go to motivational quote or phrase that gets someone hyped up and, you know, like encouraged and psyched up? And, you know, what would you normally say to somebody? Uh, OK, if I absolutely had to do the like hype thing, yeah. I would say uh, well begun is half done. Well begun is half done. OK. Okay. Uh, I might also say, um, yeah, I, I like that one. Um, and I'll use that one in my next time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and, um, and go easy on yourself. Ah, uh, go easy on yourself. Just, mm. uh, I think discipline, if discipline, self-discipline feels hard, you might be doing it wrong. Mm. Um, you know, y y y you ever notice the really weird thing about people who go to the gym like every morning? Yeah. It's that they actually really enjoy it. Yeah, they do. Right? Isn't that, like, isn't that weird? Like, they go up yeah. at four in the morning to go for a run, and it's mm -hmm. like, well, they're not torturing themselves. Um, well, four in the morning, you might be. But mm -hmm. people who, like, work out regularly, they do it because they actually live better. Yeah. Right? Um, so go easy on yourself. Just, like, never run when you can walk. That's true. You know? Just, just yeah. <laughs> wow, amazing, amazing. We beat ourselves up like crazy, especially in our 20s, and I think... And I'm probably wrong about this. I was about to say, especially young men, I think there's a, I think there's a sort of tortured masculinity thing um, these days where it's like, well, we're not the we're not the brawlers and hunters and and providers that we used to be because our, our yeah. place in society is shifting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, we've got this extra, you know, ten to twenty five percent of muscle as opposed to our female counterparts, and we are built to get you know, beat up a little bit more than 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 our, our female counterparts. And so there's something in there, both socially and, 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 and biologically, that, that pushes us to want, to, to want strife yeah. and to want rites of passages and to want things that hurt. You know, when I was 19, when I was 19, I was looking, I got into MMA when I was 19. Wow. And I'd like practically never been in a fight in my life. Mm. And it was just like, I wanted to get punched in the face, man, because I was 19 and, and like <laughs> yeah. full of testosterone or whatever yeah. it is. Mm. And, and, and the thing is that'll, that'll, that's, that's good, I think. But in the mm. extreme, when it stops maybe being physical and starts being like anxiogenic and like self-flagellating, like there, mm. there's a, there's a, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know where I'm going with this, No, absolutely. but there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a there we hurt ourselves sometimes and, and i know plenty of women who do this too go easy on yourself yeah i really like that i like i'm going to use that in simon t says <laughs> okay <laughs> i really like that because toxic masculinity is a big thing men are taught to be you know be a man yeah. about it you know you need to you know like you and, know and I'm, and I'm something of a, i'm gonna get lynched on the internet for this i'm, uh, I'm something of a traditionalist as far as mm -hmm. this goes not really i mean you know yeah I, I'm, 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 my partner is an outspoken feminist and I suppose I, I kind of am too. Mm. But my point is I do like the, the, the classical symbols of masculinity are something that I do feel quite close to in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Mm -hmm. It's just that like, there's this other thing too, thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Have you been able to think about a book or a publication or anything that um, has impacted you the most? At all? I'm struggling with this. No, no uh, worries. No there's, worries. There's a lot of it. Uh, <laughs> we, can, we can come back to that. Okay, so who's the person or people that have inspired you the most? Who are the people Someone who have inspired me the most. Yeah, or motivated you the most um, in your life so far. Yeah, I don't, I don't get really that inspired by individuals. I get inspired by like types of people, archetypes, okay. if you will. Okay. Um, I think I've always had a fascination um, for generals and mm. and and fighters uh, mm. of some, uh, you know, whether it's like you know. Um, 
you know, Patton or, or, or mm -hmm. Napoleon or, or um, yeah. And it's, it's not that they're perfect beings, right? You know, they, they, they did kill a lot of people. This is not a good thing. Yeah. But um, what, I, what, I, what I suppose I admire in that category of people is that these are people who have been handed usually really, really bad situations where there are no real winning moves, right? Yeah. And there's, in the ones I like are the ones who manage not only to lead a people to victory in dire circumstances, but also people who maintain their humanity in those circumstances. Um, and, and that's something I find really fascinating. It's like, what makes these people take, what is their system of values that allows them to both do the horrifying but necessary things, um, but also not become animals? Right. And there's, there's, there's something like, you know, okay. I was hesitating to say this cause I'm really not religious, at least not in the typical sense, but even if you're not religious, like you should read religious texts. Mm -hmm. They're actually like really interesting, especially if you analyze the symbols, um, and, and, and sort of take a very abstract symbolic view of it yeah. and, and then leave divinity to, to sort of the individual's preference. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like, I think the reason I like generals and those kinds of people uh, is it has to do with the, um, uh, blessed are the meek passage in the Bible, for instance, mm -hmm. which apparently uh, my, my sources may be a bit wrong on this, but from what I read, this is actually a mistranslation from, from the original text. And it, yeah. the original translation was something closer to blessed in the sense of, of will do well in life. So mm -hmm. blessed are those who know how to use a sword, mm -hmm. but know when to keep it sheathed. Okay. And it's the same thing with, uh, with um, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Apparently it's more like, Blessed are those who have really piercing wit, but also know when to shut the fuck up, mm. right? And, yeah, it's yeah. Like, and, yeah. and, and this is the thing that I, that I like about great generals, is that mm. these are people who are capable of extraordinary, extraordinarily and systematic violence, mm -hmm. right? But they also know when not to fight. Yeah, absolutely. Yo, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming <laughs> on the show. I've learned so much. Much and, uh, appreciated, man. It's a yeah, pleasure yeah. as always. Uh, feel free to come back anytime on the show and tell us more about your progress. You tell me, man. Great. <laughs>